Hi class, I want to talk about power intensity in decibels today. And the idea of power should be familiar to you from uh, Physics 1, and that's just energy per second. So in terms of waves that we're talking about in this class, there's a source that produces waves, and the source puts energy into the medium, a certain amount of energy every second, so that's the power of the source. And so if you remember, power is measured in watts, a watt is a joule per second. So we can consider a couple of different sources. If you just think about light, for example, you think about a 5-watt light bulb. 5 watts means that if it's 100% efficient, it takes 5 joules every second from the electric circuit it's plugged into, and it gives that off in the form of, so let's say, visible light if it's a light bulb that we're trying to use to see things. Regular incandescent light bulbs are maybe like 5% efficient or maybe 10% maybe. Uh, so there's a lot of a wasted energy that goes into infrared light and mainly infrared that you just can't see. It's kind of a waste. But anyway, suppose you do have a 5 watt light bulb though. It's giving off 100% of its energy in the form of visible light. And if we compare that to a laser, a 5 watt laser, well it's also giving off 5 joules every second in the form of visible light, maybe red or something like that. So what's the difference? Well there's no difference in terms of the energy produced by the source uh, put into the uh, you know, sort of the light wave. In, in the case of light, there's no medium that's vibrating, as we've talked about. So it's put into the electric and magnetic fields. They're vibrating in some way. We'll get into that later. But, but there's no difference in terms of the energy per second that these two sources are putting in to the, uh, to the wave. So what is the difference? Well, the difference lies in something called intensity. And so as a wave travels, that energy gets spread out over some wave front, and that wave front has a shape as some sort of a shape. And if you think about a shape like a, a sphere maybe, if you have a circular wave or spherical wave, let's say, that, that wave front is a sphere. And the energy is kind of spread out over that sphere. And as the light or the sound, whatever the wave is, moves away from the source, that energy gets spread out over a bigger and bigger area, the area of a bigger and bigger sphere. So intensity is basically just power divided by that area. If A is the area of the entire wavefront that the energy is sort of put into, in a sense, then the intensity is power divided by that area. And of course, if you're, if it's a spherical wavefront, then the sphere gets bigger as it moves further away from the source, and so its area gets bigger, and so the area being in the bottom means the intensity would get lower and lower. So this is an example of plane waves, waves that are where the wavefronts are just flat sheets. And this is a good approximation. If you're very far from a source, the light is kind of, uh, these spheres are kind of flat. You don't really notice that they're actually big spheres because they're so far away. But these, there's energy in each of these planes. And you can think of those, the energy is hitting a surface every second, so much energy every second, traveling toward that surface at some speed. The intensity would be the power of the energy per second uh, divided by the area. So if we think about circular or spherical wavefronts, the area is the area of a sphere, 4 pi r squared. And so the intensity would be power divided by 4 pi r squared. So intensity then for a, uh, a source that gives off spherical waves decreases like 1 over the distance squared. That's the famous inverse square law. So if you're 1 meter, let's say, from a light bulb, and you're measuring a certain intensity, a certain brightness, then if you double your distance to, say, 2 meters away, doubling the distance means that your intensity is going to go down by a factor of 4. So that's the inverse square law. So here's a, uh, here's a source, and if you're at one distance r1, you're going to measure a certain intensity. All the energy produced by that source is sort of, in a sense, contained in this wavefront. I mean, it's not exactly true, but kind of it's like an average idea to think about. There's, of course, other parts of the wave that are vibrating. That, you know, we don't just have wavefronts. Wavefronts are just a model of kind of describing the wave or drawing the wave graphically. But anyway, if you imagine that all the energy was contained in a wavefront, this wavefront has the radius r1, there's a certain intensity, power divided by 4 pi r1 squared. This r2 is twice as big, and so uh, along this wavefront, as long as the source is just doing the same thing all the time, there's the same energy in this wavefront, but this wavefront's much bigger. So it's a much bigger uh, size, much bigger area has twice the radius and therefore it has four times the area. So the intensity is going to have uh, is going to be four times smaller. So we can see that with a little ratio. If we look at a ratio of two uh, intensities, 
intensity at radius 1 divided by intensity at radius 2 turns out to just be the uh, ratio of the radii, r2 divided by r1 squared. Or another way, if we rearrange, bring the i2 over onto the other side, i1 is equal to i2 times this ratio. So i1 is a certain number, let's say it's 10, and then i2 is going to be, uh, or yeah, or let's say i2 is some number, let's see, the way we've got it written here, let's say i2 is 100, and if we multiply this ratio, r2 divided by r1, if r2 is 2 times bigger than r1, then this is going to be 2 squared divided by, you know, 2 r1 squared divided by r1 squared. That'll be 4, right? So if i2 happens to be 100, then i1 is going to be 4 times 100, or 400. So if you double your distance, the intensity goes down by 4. If you cut your distance in half, the intensity goes up by 4 by a factor of four. So that's what happens with spherical waves. And a lot of things in nature are good approximations to spherical waves, especially light coming from distant objects like stars and distant flashlights, things like that. The light kind of spreads out in spherical wave fronts. So back to the laser beam and light bulb example, now we can compare the two. The difference in energy per second produced by them isn't, isn't really different. They each produce five watts of energy. But the light bulb, if we imagine that light bulb spreads out its energy over a sphere, then to find the intensity, we divide by 4 time, four pi times the radius squared. And let's assume, let's just suppose we're 1 meter away from the light bulb. So all that light produced by the light bulb is getting spread out into an, a, uh, a sphere with radius 1 meter where we are located. And so we will measure an intensity of 0 0.398 watts per square meter, joules per second per square meter. So if you had 1 square meter of surface at that distance, then you would have 0 0.398 joules per second hitting that square meter. That's what intensity means. It means if you had a square meter surface sort of to detect the light, you would be getting 0 0.398 joules every second over that square meter. So a laser beam is a little different. A laser beam doesn't spread out. It, it does actually a little bit. It might take a few miles for it to, to increase its size, but a laser beam is, you know, pretty um, narrow, cylindrical beam of light. And let's uh, consider maybe a beam that has a diameter of one millimeter. So the laser beam itself has a diameter of one millimeter. That's a radius of 0 0.5 millimeters then. And so when that laser beam hits some surface, it leaves a circular spot, the cross section of that cylinder. And so instead of looking at intensity as being power divided by the area of a sphere, the energy isn't going to be getting spread out over a sphere. It's just spread out over the, the cross-section of that cylinder, and that's a circle. So we have a, the area of a circle down here, the power divided by the area of a circle. And the, and the radius is really small, half a millimeter. So divide 5 watts, divided by, or take 5 watts divided by that area, and you get a very big number, 6.4 million watts per square meter. So if you took this laser beam and you or you took a bunch of identical laser beams to make up one big laser beam that was one square meter in radius, uh, in area, I mean, uh, then you would have an energy per second of 6.4 million joules every second hitting some surface. That's, that's huge. It's in, that's incredibly powerful. But, you know, we'd have, we typically don't have laser beams that big, but still, a laser beam, the size that you would typically have in a laser pointer, is, can be quite powerful. Uh, little laser pointers that you hold in your hand are more like 5 milliwatts, not 5 watts. So take this number and divide by 1,000. That's still big. 6.4 thousand would be the uh, uh, the energy every second. That's a lot. That's still a lot. That, that's still enough to do damage to your eye, especially if it if it kind of sits in your on your retina for you know a second or two. It could definitely do damage. So don't play with laser beams. So what about mechanical waves. There's some things we can talk about with mechanical waves that are kind of interesting. If you think about the fact that a source causes medium, the medium to vibrate for a mechanical wave, the medium has is material that's vibrating. And to a good approximation, we can think of the material as vibrating like little masses on springs. So if we think back to physics one, uh, the energy of a mass on a spring, there, well, there's in, generally, in general, there's kinetic and potential energy, but as long as we're thinking about energy being conserved and we're not thinking about friction being in the system, then we can write the total mechanical energy as 
1 half times k, the spring constant, times the amplitude of vibration squared. That's the total mechanical energy. It's a constant. As time goes on, it gets split between kinetic and potential. But at some point, when it reaches its maximum displacement, all the energy is purely potential energy, and this is definitely the value that it has, purely in potential energy, but that value never changes. That total doesn't change, because we're talking about a conservative force. We're talking about a mass on a spring with no friction or air resistance or anything like that. This K, though, in this case, is called an effective spring constant, because when you look at a medium where, say, there's sound waves going through it or a wave on a string or something, we don't really have springs connected to the material, but but in effect, there are forces pulling the material back toward an equilibrium position, just like a spring would do. And so the forces are, are linear and they're opposite the displacement, just like a spring force. So in effect, it's, it's exactly the same. So we call this the effective spring constant, to suggest that really there aren't actual little springs. But like a spring, we can look at the frequency. So the angular frequency, if you remember from physics one, of a mass on a spring is the square root of the spring constant divided by the mass. So the mass is the mass attached to the spring. So let's just take this, solve for k, plug it into the energy equation, and that gives us this here, this guy here. This is just another way of writing the total mechanical energy of a vibrating mass on a spring in terms of the angular frequency omega. And then if you remember that angular frequency is 2 pi times the linear frequency, we can plug that in here, square it, and we just get another expression for the uh, mass on a spring, or the energy of a mass on a spring in terms of the linear frequency. And, and that's useful because we often talk about linear frequencies, you know, 10 hertz, 10 vibrations per second. That's often what you think about when you talk about, or talk about when you're uh, talking about vibrating springs and stuff like that. So this is just another way of writing that total energy of a mass on a spring. So somehow the mass that's vibrating, this little mass, gets energy. It gets energy from the source. Well, where does that energy come from? How is that related to the source, the energy produced by the source? How, ma how much mass do we need to put here? Well, if we think about the fact that well, this is a wave traveling through some material, that material has some density. So the mass is going to be the density times some volume. So if it's water, let's say, the density is going to be the density of water. If it's air, that would be then the density of air. So that would be the mass mass that's vibrating would be density times volume. All right, well, what kind, how much volume are we talking about then? What do we put in here for volume? Well, the volume is, the volume we're thinking about is the volume that the wave is putting energy into. So to some degree, that's kind of arbitrary. We can, we can try to think about, it is sort of arbitrary. It depends on a lot of things, actually. It depends on how much time goes by. Because, you know, how much time are you going to let the wave travel and put energy into space? The more time you allow the wave to travel to put energy into space, the bigger space it occupies because it travels through that space. As long as the source continues to provide energy, continues to make the medium vibrate, that energy gets put into larger and larger regions of space. So if we could just consider some time t, some time t, maybe one second, two second, whatever it might be, if we took that and multiplied it by v, the speed of the wave, that just gives us the distance the wave travels and that time is t. So this is a distance in the direction that the wave is traveling. If we multiply that by an area perpendicular to the direction the wave is traveling, then we have a volume. We have a volume of space where one direction uh, is the distance traveled, and then the other perpendicular side of that volume is some area A. And, and, you know, generally that area A is, could be a small thing, depending on how much space you're talking about. So let's plug all this in. Let's plug in uh, density times volume, and then for volume, let's put this in here. And so now what we've got is we've got an expression for energy of, vibrate, of the vibrating medium in terms of some area, and this could be a small area. If it's a small area, there's small energy. If it's a big area, there's big energy. If we let a lot of time go by, there's a lot of energy because we're letting the wave occupy more and more space. So these are a couple factors here that we kind of control. How much energy are we talking about? How much time are we talking about? How much area are we considering? So, but now remember that power is one of the things we want to talk about. And power is just energy per time, energy over time. So if we take energy divided by time, that, can, that gets rid of that T right there. So our equation for power then is this. Same thing as energy, but we don't have the T. And then, if we want to think about intensity, we divide by area. 
the area A. And so divide out that area A. So this is an equation that's fairly useful. It's, it's useful for many different situations to describe the intensity of a mechanical wave. The wave moves through some material, through a medium that has a certain density. The wave moves at a certain speed. The wave has a certain frequency. And the medium vibrates with a certain amplitude. If you knew all those factors, you could calculate the intensity. Or oftentimes what is done is you measure the intensity and you can measure the density of the material. That's a fairly well-known thing, depending on the material, air, water, whatever it might be. Frequency is easy to measure for waves. The speed is easy to measure for waves. You can use those measurements and, and calculate how big of a vibration the medium is, is making. How, you know, from equilibrium, is the, is the medium vibrating, you know, one centimeter above and below equilibrium, like a wave on a string, or how is it vibrating? So that's one thing you can do, but the point here, before we do an example, is that intensity is proportional to the square of the amplitude of vibration. That's a very general statement. We've derived this so far from mechanical waves, but a very similar equation comes in for light waves. You don't have density of the material because there isn't a material, and the speed of the wave is, of course, the speed of light. There are some factors a little bit different in here, and we'll get to that eventually, but there's still something that's vibrating that has an amplitude and the intensity, the energy per second per square meter, is still proportional to that amplitude squared. It's a very general relationship between intensity and amplitude. So as an example, we can think about sound. If you think about the quietest sound waves that you can hear with your ear, an average ear, if we think specifically about a sound that's 100 hertz, that's little f, that's the frequency f, a wave that's 100 hertz, has 100 hertz frequency, it turns out that the lowest intensity that you can detect is about 10 to the minus 9 watts per square meter. All right, 10 to the minus 9, that's a really small number, and these intensities that the human ear are sensitive to can be extremely small. So 10 to the minus 9 is the intensity we want to plug in up here in this equation. 10 to the minus 9. And then we'll plug in a value for density of air, speed of sound, and the frequency of 100 hertz, and we'll calculate the amplitude of those waves. So here we solve for the amplitude of the uh, medium, 1 over pi times frequency, and then there's a square root. We had to take a square root because the amplitude was squared. Uh, intensity divided by 2 density times speed. Plug all those numbers in, we get this. And this is quite remarkable, I think. The, if you listen to one of the quietest sound you can hear, say 100 hertz, the medium is moving just a few nanometers. That's billionths of a meter. I mean, that's incredible nanometers. Your ear is sensitive, so sensitive that it can detect the motion of air, you know, little packets of air, not necessarily individual molecules, but little packets of air vibrating at just a few nanometers of amplitude. That's really small. Those are very, very small vibrations. It gives you a sense of how sensitive the human ear is. And, you know, just think about other animals that have even more sensitive hearing. It's really remarkable what some of our biological systems are capable of detecting. So sound waves, going back to sound waves again in a little more detail, I'd mentioned that these intensities that our ear is sensitive to are extremely small. So we are most sensitive to frequencies around 3000 hertz, and the lowest intensity around that frequency is about 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. So that's really small. That's often referred to as the threshold of hearing. Any intensity below this, you're pretty much not gonna hear regardless of the frequency. So this is around 3,000 hertz around there where the ear is most sensitive to. And everybody's ear is a little bit different than everybody else. So the high, the loudest sound that we're sensitive to, where damage could be done very quickly, is about 10, about 10 uh, watts per square meter. That's a lot. But look at the difference. 10 to the minus 12 to 10. That's 13 orders of magnitude, a range over which our ear can hear things. So it's a huge range of intensities that our ear is sensitive to. So what people did is they came up with a new scale, a new way of describing loudness or the intensity level called the decibel scale, named after Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the, the uh, telephone. So the way it works is you do a comparison between the threshold of hearing and a particular intensity that you're interested in. And you look at a ratio of those intensities, and then you take the uh, base 10 log of that ratio, and then you just multiply by 10 just to make things uh, nice, I guess, in a sense. So this I0 is your intensity, uh, the threshold of hearing, 
10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. And uh, I is the intensity of whatever sound you're talking about. This beta then is the decibel level that you're hearing. So if we look at a scale of possibilities, 10 to the minus 12 again being the threshold of hearing, that would be zero, a beta equals zero. If I put I zero divided by I zero there, I get log of one. Log of one is zero. Zero times 10 is zero. So the threshold of hearing is zero. And if I go all the way to the top, uh, an intensity of 10, I get 10 divided by 10 to the minus 12. That's 10 to the 13 power, 10 to the plus 13. Log of that is 13. Multiply that by 10, I get 130. So in the, in the decibel scale, the uh, loudness levels, the intensity levels, go from 0 to 130. Much more manageable scale of numbers to deal with when you describe the sound levels of things. So here's a little table of different uh, intensity levels. A quiet room has a decibel level about 30, a quiet restaurant about 50. Uh, busy traffic around 70. If you go to rock concerts a lot, you're hearing sound that's very close to the threshold of hearing. Or the uh, not threshold of hearing. Threshold of pain. I don't think I said what that was, though. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that 10 watts per square meter is called the threshold of pain. So very quickly, you'll start to experience pain in your ear because you'll be damaging your eardrum. So if you think about the differences, then we'll do an example. But if you think about the differences between these uh, decibel levels, if you look at a difference in 10, let's say from 110 to 120, a difference in that decibel level. Going back up to the equation, a difference in 10 of this means that there's a, a difference of what? A difference of 2 in the log. Let's say you're going from 10 to 20 or something. So I would have to have a 10 here to make that a 1. Let me do an example. The, the point is, is that if you have a, a factor of 10 difference in the intensity, a factor of 10 difference in the intensity would make this ratio a 1 log of 1, I mean, would make this ratio a 10, I'm sorry. All right, log of 10 is 1. 1 times 10 is 10. That would be a, a decibel level of 10, a difference of 10. So in other words, so going from 110 to 120 decibel levels, you're multiplying that intensity by a factor of 10. So for example, suppose we have two sounds. Sound 1 has an intensity level that is two times larger than the other sound. So here's a factor of 2 different. So one intensity is two times the other intensity. What, what is the decibel level difference between those sounds? So I want to subtract the louder sound minus the quieter sound. So just plug in the equation for each. Beta for each is 10 decibels divided or times the log of the ratio of the intensity divided by the threshold of hearing. Subtract those two betas. And then you remember properties of logs. A ratio, a log of a ratio is just the difference in logs. So this is going to be log of I1 minus log of I0. And then I've got minus log of I2. And then minus log of I0, but there's another minus in front of it, so that makes that a plus. And then this minus log of I0 is going to cancel this plus log of I0. So I end up with this log of I1 minus log of I2, which I can just write as a ratio of log of I1 divided by I2. And so I1 is two times bigger than I2, so that ratio is two. And then so my, de my uh, de uh, decibel level difference is 10 times log of two. And if you put that into your calculator very carefully not to get it confused with natural logs, this is a base 10 log. So check your calculator, make sure you know how to do base 10 logs in your calculator. You should get 3.01 decibels. So a sound that's say 10 decibels, and then another sound that's 13 decibels, those two sounds actually have a factor of two difference in actual intensity between them. So let me know if you have any questions. This is all we have to say about power, intensity, and um, decibel levels. And when we get into light waves again, we'll talk more about intensity and power with specifically uh, for light waves. Have a good night.